Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies for this evening's Meet the Researcher lecture. My name is Dr. Jeremy Salmon, and I'm a research fellow here at the Centre. Before we start, could I just ask you to ensure that your phones are turned off? And you should also be aware that the proceedings are being filmed, and if you don't wish to feature on our website, uh, then maybe you shouldn't ask a question during the Q&A. Tonight's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Andrew Baker. This is Andrew's debut as a speaker at the CIS. Andrew has a BA Honours in Philosophy from Monash University and a Master's in Public Policy and Management from the University of Melbourne. Before joining the CIS earlier this year as a Policy Analyst in the Social Foundations Program, he was an advisor to the Shadow Minister for Disabilities and Carers and the Voluntary Sector, Senator Mitch Fifield. His topic tonight is the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which he has dubbed the New Leviathan. As I'm sure you're aware, the NDIS is a very timely issue. Both sides of federal politics have given an in principle commitment to implement the scheme, although what this means given the state of the public finances is really anyone's guess. And this is the main subject that Andrew will be talking about tonight, the financial implications of the NDIS. Now those familiar with the work of the CIS won't be surprised to hear that he is critical of its potential size, cost and unaffordability. This also won't surprise uh, many of the people who comment at websites like the ABC's The Drum, who will probably relish the opportunity to seize on this apparent proof that so-called right-wing think tanks are as heartless as they imagine. However, I think that this is precisely the type of topic that benefits from a CIS-style treatment if the well-recognised problems with disability services in this country are to be comprehensively addressed by the national scheme. Now, as we know, as we've known through the NDIS process, there's large amounts of unmet need for disability services in the community, and at the state level, they're patchy at best, and they're underfunded. Now, uh, those in and a society should be judged by how it treats its most vulnerable members. Although what isn't said nearly enough is that the parlous state of disability services is really an indictment on the contemporary welfare state. Despite governments having government having grown and grown, the inverse care law clearly applies and the level of government support provided to different groups tend to vary, tends to vary inversely uh, with level of need. Another way to put this is that the more the big government tries to be all things to all people, the less it succeeds in fulfilling its legitimate role of helping those who can't help themselves. Governments that refuse to set priorities and target assistance find they can't afford to help those who need the greatest assistance and as the record shows, once the money gets tight, it is a politically less important uh, who tend to miss out, including the disabled and their carers. This is what's happened at the state level, and these are exactly the kind of pitfalls that Andrew will be warning against tonight. Andrew's going to um, uh, speak for approximately 40 minutes, uh, leaving around 25 minutes for questions before we conclude at approximately 7.15. So please join me in welcoming Andrew to tell us why the, new, why the NDIS could be a new Leviathan. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. The Gillard government has committed to establishing at least three large and expensive spending initiatives. The Gonski reforms to school education, a new Denticare scheme, which will provide subsidised dental care for low-income households, and the biggest of them all, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, or NDIS. Unfortunately, there, there seems to be a naive understanding and a lack of scrutiny of the sheer size and cost of the NDIS. This is partly a result partly the result of, a substantial, of the substantial public and political goodwill towards the scheme, as well as uni almost universal support from the disability sector. The reality is the NDIS will be bigger, much bigger than what most ordinary Australians imagine. In fact, the NDIS will be a monster. It will be the new leviathan of the Australian welfare state. This presentation will look at the development of the NDIS over the last few years and through to 2018-19 when the scheme is expected to be fully operational. Sorry. In 2009, the Commonwealth and State Government spent around $7 billion on disability care and support services. Of this, $4.7 billion came from the States and the remaining $2.3 billion came from the Commonwealth. These figures do not include the $15.5 billion that the Commonwealth spent on income support payments for disability pensioners and carers. This year, the Commonwealth Government alone will spend $24 billion in total on services and supports for people with disability, their carers and families. Despite this extraordinary spending, there is widespread evidence of systemic problems within the disability sector 
that desperately need to be resolved. The current system of disability support has been characterised as a lottery, a confusopoly and a maze. According to one report, many people with disability feel they are socially, culturally and politically isolated. They are ignored, invisible and silent. They struggle to be noticed, they struggle to be seen, they struggle to have their voices heard. The day-to-day -day struggles of people with disability are a symptom of inadequate resources and the rationing of services in the sector. Rationing in turn places substantial pressures on families to provide the 24-hour care and support that some people with disability need. These demands often push people with disability, their carers and families towards tragedy and crisis. Take for example this quote from a senior psychiatrist working in the sector. The regularity with which I meet some parents with murder-suicide ideation as they have been un unable to find adequate help for their child is both alarming but also a marker of the failure of coordination of any service. I also note this, that murder-suicide in these families is becoming a more recognised event as recently occurred in Victoria. Some parents can no longer look after their child for any number of reasons. A recent study found that in Victoria alone, around 50 families relinqu relinquish day-to-day -day care of a child with disability into state care every year. Other parents have spent their entire lives caring for a child with disability. Now in their 60s, 70s and 80s, these parents can no longer provide care to their child because they are in need of care themselves. Another study by the New South Wales government found that the rate of informal care provided by families and friends was just decreasing steadily, while the number of people with disability was increasing at the same time. This relationship has been described as a, quote, death spiral. The problems faced at the individual and family level also have an impact on the broader economic picture. Only 25% of people with a disability have finished year 12, which as a proportion of the population is only half those without a disability. Likewise, only 12% of people with disability have finished university and received at least a bachelor's degree. Again, this is about half of those without. Disturbingly, the proportion of people with disability who have an education at year eight level or lower is more than five to four times that of those without a disability. Some of these outcomes are no doubt a result of the nature of a disability, for example, an intellectual disability. But in the long run, poor educational outcomes have an impact on workforce participation, welfare dependence and poverty. As this table shows, the workforce participation rate for people without a disability is almost 30 percentage points higher than it is for people with a disability. Furthermore, workforce participation rates drop steadily the more severe the disability. Those classified by the Australian Bureau of Statistics as having a profound core activity limitation at a participation rate of less than 20%. The lack of education and employment in turn increases the likelihood of living in poverty. A PricewaterhouseCoopers report found that Australians with disability are more likely to be living in or near relative poverty than Australians without. They're also more likely to be living in relative poverty than their counterparts overseas. The social and economic problems facing people with disability and their families has been attributed to a range of factors but are largely a consequence of the current financial and governance arrangements for disability services and support. The Productivity Commission summarised the problem pithily and I quote, the current disability support system is underfunded, unfair, fragmented and inefficient. It gives people with a, dis with a disability little choice and no certainty of access to appropriate supports. The stresses on the system are growing with ri rising costs for all governments. The lack of funding in the disability sector means that Soviet-style rationing is commonplace. Some people have to wait years for specialised wheelchairs or supported accommodation places to become available. The lack of funding places pressure on other services. For example, the lack of supported accommodation beds can mean that people occupy short-term respite be beds for long periods of time or remain in hospital beds indefinitely. This is also known as bed blocking. In addition to widespread underfunding, the disability sector suffers from excessive red tape, paternalistic policies, bureaucratic inefficiency and poor levels of innovation and flexibility. People with disability often have little control over the services they receive and how they receive them. For example, if someone receiving supports in one state decides to move elsewhere for a job or family reasons, they may not receive the same supports as before. I hope it is quite clear 
that the st structure of disability services and support in Australia is broken and it needs to be fixed. That's where the NDIS comes in. It is a response to all these and many other issues. It is a result of cost-benefit analysis of a new long-term disability care and support scheme that the Commonwealth Government asked the Productivity Commission to, to conduct. The Commission concluded that was a need for not one but two schemes. A National Disability Insurance Scheme or NDIS and a National Injury Insurance Scheme or NIIS. The NDIS is the larger and better known of the two schemes. Its aim is to provide insurance cover for all Australians in the event of a disability. In practice, it would provide lifetime care and support to those who are born with a disability or who acquire a disability over time, for example, blindness through macular degeneration. The NDIS, NDIS would not provide care and support to people who acquire a disability from a catastrophic injury, for example, a spinal cord or brain, brain injury as a result of a car accident. Support for disabilities acquired from catastrophic injuries will be provided by the NIIS. These two schemes came about because some states already have some kind of catastrophic injury insurance scheme in place while others do not. For example, Victoria has, has the Transport Accident Commission and New South Wales has a Lifetime Care and Support Authority, both providing supports to people who acquire a disability through motor accidents. In contrast, Queensland and South Australia do not have similar insurance schemes and people who acquire a disability through an accident in these states typically required to find an at-fault party to sue in order to fund the costs of lifetime care and support. The differences between the states are also why the NIIS will be a federated scheme under state government control through and funded through compulsory premiums and levies. In contrast, the NDIS will be a national scheme under Commonwealth control funded through general revenue. The NIIS is also smaller than the NDIS Productivity Commission estimated that the NIIS would have a net additional cost of $830 million on top of existing expenditure of about $1 billion every year. This would provide services and support to about 30,000 people. In contrast, the Commission estimated that the NDIS in 2009 would have a net additional cost of approximately $8 billion on top of $7 billion in existing spending in order, in order to meet the unmet demand for disability services. Combining the eight and seven billion dollar figures, we get a gross cost of 15 billion a year to provide provide funded services to around 411,000 people aged less than 65 years. Given that the NDIS is substantially larger than the NIIS, much of the political, public, and media attention is focused on the NDIS than the NIIS. This is also why the NDIS is the focus of my presentation tonight. However, I'm happy to address any questions you might have about the NIIS after the speech. The overall cost of the NDIS leads to, leads to the questions, who are going to receive funded supports and what are they going to receive? The NDIS will provide disability care and support based on what is assessed to be the reasonable and necessary requirements of a person with disability. The NDIS eligibility criteria are currently undergoing consultation process but have not been set in stone. But the NDIS is also sure to cover intellectual, physical and psychiatric disabilities, chronic and episodic disabilities and children with global de development delay. However, simply having one of these disabilities will not be enough for eligibility. The Commission recommended the NDIS support, sh support should only be provided to those aged less than the pension age, which is currently 65 years for men. The disability also has to be permanent or likely to be permanent has to have a material impact on someone's capacity to live a normal, li normal life. This includes their capacity to participate in employment, education and the community at large. The NDIS will fund supports to help people with disability participate in these activities or at the very least meet their basic needs. For example, the NDIS will fund personal carers who help people to do the basic things that that they cannot do for themselves, like taking showers, going to the toilet and helping to prepare meals. Also fund supported accommodation, beds, respite care, aids and equipment, transport and mobility assistance, Australian disability enterprises, which are also known as sheltered workshops, and guide and assistance dogs. The Commission did not intend for the scheme to cover everything that people with disability use. For this reason, health and hospital care, education, public transport, disability employment services, income support payments like the DSP and carer payment 
and aged care support are not intended to be funded through the NDIS. The NDIS will not directly provide these services to individuals, rather, th rather they will be provided through a new agency called the National Disability Insurance Agency, which will assess eligibility for people with disability and provide funding according to their reasonable and, ne reasonable and necessary needs. NDIS funded supports will be provided to recipients on a consumer choice basis. For most people this means that they will be provided with vouchers that would allow them to purchase a fixed number of services from a provider of their choice. Others could choose to cash out their disability funding package and manage it themselves. For example, someone assessed as requiring 20 speech therapy sessions every year could use the vouchers to purchase the sessions or cash out the value of the vouchers and manage their own budget. Individuals would have the power to choose to purchase their supports directly, but within broad guidelines that, that ensure the financial sustainability of the NDIS. Additional sessions would not be taxpayer funded and the cost would be borne by the individual. Either of these initiatives would empower individuals to make their own choices about their care. It would also in introduce market mechanisms where good service providers flourish and poor ones fail. However, this voucher mo model also entails a degree of government price control for disability services, where a government agency will determine the efficient prices for, t for particular services. In this sense, the NDIS will be similar to Medicare, or the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Despite the prospect for price controls, the NDIS will not come cheap. As you can see here, there have been a number of attempts to cost the NDIS. Early estimates suggest that the scheme will provide support to around 600,000 people at a net cost of 5.2 billion, or 10.8 billion gross annual, sorry, that's gross annual cost. More thorough estimates from the Productivity Commission's draft report predicted that if the NDIS had existed in 2009-10, it would have provided funded supports to 360,000 people at a net cost of 6 billion or 13 billion gross. Following a further round of consultation, the size and cost of the scheme increased once again. The Commission's final report increased the number of eligible people to 411,000 and the net and gross costs upwards by another 500 million to 6.5 billion and 13.5 billion, respectively. <coughs> this upward revision was because of the inclusion of tens of thousand people with a significant and enduring psychiatric disability who would benefit from the supports the NDIS would provide. But wait, there's more. The overall cost of the NDIS has continued to rise. The decision by Fair Work Australia to increase wages for social and community sector workers, the so-called SACS case, increased the net and gross cost of the NDIS by approximately $1.5 billion without increasing the population eligible for funded supports. The net cost figure of $8 billion and the gross figure of 15 are the most widely used figures in the public arena. However, there is a significant problem with both numbers. The Commission has calculated the cost of the NDIS by taking a snapshot of disability expenditure in 2019. Its, estimate, its estimates are based on 2019 prices, population and cost. However, some of you may have noticed that the NDIS did not exist in 2019, and as this table from the Productivity Commission shows, the NDIS will not be fully operational until at least 2018-19. This crucial point has not been adequately communicated to the public. The Productivity Commission's cost and population estimates did not take into account price increases, wage inflation and population growth from 2009-10 to 2018-19. What this means is that the figures being used in the public discussion on the NDIS do not adequately reflect the true cost of the scheme when it is fully operational in 2018-19. In effect, voters are being asked to buy the NDIS now at a total cost of $15 billion, but pay later when the actual cost of the scheme will be billions more. The disconnect between the estimated and actual costs of the NDIS was one of the key motivations behind my research here at the Centre for Independent Studies. Through this work, I became aware that the government knew the NDIS would cost substantially more than they said it would, because the government had commissioned a secret report stating just that. Under freedom of information laws, I requested this secret report, 
conducted by the Australian Government Actuary, or AGA, which outlined in detail the progressive costs of the NDIS to 2018-19. The AGA report took into account price inflation, wage increases and population growth and the impact of the Fair Work Australia SACS wage decision. It also reviewed the Commission's costing methodology and made a number of revisions to these estimates. Overall, the AGA estimated that in 2018-19, the NDIS would fund services for 441,000 people at a net cost of $10.5 billion, or a gross cost of $22 billion every year. Effectively, taxpayers will be spending, on average, around $50,000 for each person receiving NDIS-funded supports in 2018-19. The AGA's report also outlined in detail the potential risks of the scheme during the development phase. A combination of high public expectations, workforce supply issues, inadequate funding, lack of cost control mechanism, poor assessment processes, flaky governance arrangements and bureaucratic efficiency could all see the $22 billion yearly cost blow out by billions more. Putting these issues to one side, there are some significant factors not mentioned by either the Commission or the Actuary that will drive the cost of the scheme rapidly in the years following full implementation in 2018-19. Both these factors involve the interaction of the NDIS with the pension age. The Commission recommended the NDIS provide funded care and support to only those aged less than the pension age, which is currently 65 years for men. The main reason for this restriction is to maximise the economic benefits that could come from the NDIS by people with disability and their carers moving off welfare payments and into the workforce. This is one of the reasons why the Commission also recommended substantial reforms to the disability support pension to ensure N the NDIS and the DSP work together rather than against each other. Because aged pensioners do not have to meet participation requirements and are not expected to work, they have no incentive or compulsion to return to the workforce if they receive NDIS funded supports. As there will likely be little or no economic benefit from them receiving supports, they have been excluded from the scheme. However, the pension age for both men and women is scheduled to increase by six months every two years from the age of 65 in July 2017 to 67 in July 2023. This will have a material impact on the size and cost of the NDIS in the first four years of operation. So not only will more people become eligible for the NDIS but those already on the scheme will receive NDIS supports for longer. However, it should also be noted that increase in the pension age and the impacts this will have on the overall cost of the NDIS will be offset through people remaining in the workforce for longer and through reduced government expenditure on the age pension. Increases in the pension age should only have a modest impact on numbers when the NDIS is fully operational in 2018-19. My conservative es estimate suggests that for every six month increase in the pension age, around 4,000 people will become eligible or remain eligible for NDIS funded supports. At a gross cost of around $50,000 per person, this would add approximately 20 million to the sorry, 200 million to the gross cost of the scheme for every six month increase in the pension age. Increasing the pension age from 65 to 67 should add around 16,000 people to the overall NDIS eligible cohort by 2023-24. The importance of the pension age as an eligibility criterion for the NDIS begs the question as to what happens to people already receiving NDIS funded supports after they reach the pension age. The Commission recommended that this group should have the option to move on to the aged care system once they reach the pension age or at any time thereafter. Providing this choice is not in itself a problem. Allowing people to choose the most appropriate support systems for themselves is good policy. However, there is a need to acknowledge that the option to continue receiving NDIS funded supports will drive growth in the NDIS, albeit with offsets from the aged care sector. As people choose to continue receiving NDIS funded supports, rather than moving back into the or moving into the aged care system. There will be substantial back-end growth in the NDIS eligible population. Import, importantly, the impact of this back-end growth was not taken into account by the Commission or the AGA. This, this suggests to me that the cost and population estimates do not take into account, adequately take into account, 
people receiving NDIS funded supports beyond the pension age. My conservative estimates suggest that this back end growth has the potential to add at least 3,000 people to the NDIS population every year. This is equivalent to less than 1% of the entire NDIS population, or around 10% of the number of people who move off the disability support pension and onto the age pension every year. Based on a cost of approximately $50,000 per person, back-end growth could ha has the potential to add around $150 million to the overall gross cost of the NDIS every year, albeit with roughly equivalent offsets from the aged care sector. So far I've outlined two key aspects in the current proposed design of the scheme that have the potential to drive growth in the size and the cost of the NDIS. However, notwithstanding this, interest groups are mobilising and applying political pressure to expand eligibility criteria to include some people with disability who will not receive supports under the scheme. Given that the NDIS is supposed to provide funded supports to only those people aged less than the pension age and have a severe disability, hundreds of thousands of people with disability will not be eligible to receive funded supports. As this graph shows, the Commission's estimate of 411,000 people receiving funded supports represents only a fraction of the 4 million people classified by the Australian Bureau of Statistics as having a disability. It doesn't even cover the 680,000 people aged 0 to 65 classified by the ABS as having a severe or profound impairment, nor does it cover the 757,000 people receiving the DSP in 2009. In fact, comparing the DSP eligible population with the Commission's NDIS eligible population shows, shows that at least 460,000 DSP recipients will not be eligible to receive NDIS funded supports. Of course, most of this cohort is eligible to vote. Approximately 600,000 people aged over 65 have, and have a severe or profound disability are not included in the scheme either. This fact has already led to calls to expand eligibility for NDIS funded supports to those older than the pension age. The Chief Executive of the Motor Neurone Disease Foundation, Rod Harris, made the case when he said, quote, By excluding people over the pension age, the NDIS is effectively putting out a sign saying, no old people. That is denying a person aged 66 the right to access the same service opportunities as a person aged 64, even though they may need identical levels of service and support and for the same reason. The Australian Greens have already dubbed this age restriction as creating a two-tier system with differential levels of treatment for people with disability above and below the pension age. There is also the potential for what is known as scope creep, and the calls to expand the scope of funded services and support to include, for example, education for students with a disability. The potential for scope creep is a serious one and has been a problem in particular with New Zealand's Accident Compensation Corporation, which provides no-fault insurance to people who suffer an injury, injury as a result of an accident. In one case in particular, the decision through the merit review process found the ACC had to pay for a lift and other features for a man with paraplegia who knowingly built a home that did not suit his own requirements and against the ACC's own rules. The New Zealand scheme has been subject to numerous requ requests to provide financial support for in-ground swimming pools, home gymnasiums, ordinary transport costs, GPS systems and childcare. It's likely that Australia's NDIs will be subject to similar requests, which if granted, threaten to see the cost of the scheme explode. It is worth looking at the expenditure history of schemes similar to the NDIS. As you can see, schemes that will provide broadly similar services to the NDIS have historically grown at a nominal rate of around 6% every year. Financial experience of New Zealand's Accident Compensation Corporation is particularly indicative of the sorts of problems the NDIS could face. Uh, no, that's that's including. It's just uh, prior to the implementation of financial reforms to the AC to the ACC, expenditure on benefit benefits grew from 1.5 billion in 2000 2001 to 3.1 billion in 08 09, or an average annual rate of 9.4%. The reason for this rapid growth was attributed to claim reactivation rates, where people 
people unexpectedly reactivated past injury claims. An aging population also drove slower recovery times, extending the length of time people received funded supports. Inflationary pressures beyond normal economic inflation in the cost of medical services, elective surgery and social rehabilitation services all drove up the cost of the scheme. This relatively high inflation was attributed to improvements in medical technology, labour shortages and administrative and regulatory changes. Reforms to the ACC scheme in 2008-09 helped mitigate expenditure growth and expenditure fell from $3.1 billion in 2008-09 to $2.6 billion in 10 11 hence reducing the average annual growth rate of the scheme. However, the experience of the New Zealand scheme and other similar schemes indicate that the NDIS will experience nominal expenditure growth of around 6% every year once it is up and running. The Leviathan will require a Leviathan-sized bureaucracy. The, Produ the Productivity Commission estimated that administration of the scheme would cost around $1.1 billion and employ nearly 6,850 local area coordinators to design, manage and manage individual disability support packages. When the NDIS is fully operational in 2018-19, the number of local area coordinators will increase to 7,350 and the overall administrative cost of the scheme will, will be $2 billion every year. As the number of people on the scheme grows, the number of coordinators and overall administrative expenditure will grow as well. By the time the NDIS is fully operational, it will have a gross cost of approximately $22 billion and a net cost of $10.5 billion. It will provide disability care and support to 441,000 people. It will directly employ more than 7,000 local area coordinators and hundreds more administrative staff based in Canberra. The expenditure in the scheme will likely grow at around 6% every year once it is fully operational. And these figures also understell the future cost of the scheme, ignore the and ignore the, the cost to the governments if they succ succumb to political pressure to expand the scope of the scheme. Given the gross cost of the scheme will be order of $22 billion, the NDIS will not only start bigger, start big, but get bigger rapidly. The NDIS will be a monster of a government program, the new leviathan of the Australian welfare state. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to open up the floor to questions.